Hey everyone, this is the Love of Cinema podcast. We like to talk movies. If you like to talk movies too, you come to the right place. But that the shot you're mentioning is kind of our, our master for the scene where, but you know, I'm always trying to look for a shot where I can just run the whole scene. So the shot, the one shot that tells the story of the whole scene and then of course then we shoot other things too you know like in that scene we have a couple of other shots but but the one shot that tells the story of the first half of the scene you know before he walks out of those mirrors um so that was kind of our master for that half of the scene uh but really i didn't really i, I, I didn't think of it so articulately like the way you said it is th- those those things i think if an audience watches it and they they and you know maybe it was deep in my subconscious Hey folks, how's everyone doing? This is Himanshu and you're listening to the Love of Cinema podcast. I hope you all are safe and healthy in these trying times and also hope everyone is staying home as much as possible. That said, welcome back. Welcome back to a brand new episode. On today's episode, a chat with someone who has made some of the most romantic and moving pictures of recent times. But before that, in case you're a new listener, And if you like this episode, do check out prior episodes of the podcast. You can find all episodes wherever you listen to your pods. Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or any of the other podcast apps. If you enjoy long-form, free-willing conversations centered around Indian cinema and streaming shows, Love of Cinema podcast was created for people just like you. So do consider subscribing. Also, Please do rate and review the podcast in Apple Podcasts as that will help others with similar taste discover this podcast. So if you rate and review us, it will be much appreciated. And don't forget to share with your friends an episode you liked. Back to today's episode. Writer director Ritesh Patra has consistently managed to make films which remain with you long after stepping out of the cinemas. whether it was his widely acclaimed lovely debut feature film the lunchbox or the wonderfully warm adaptation of kent haru's our souls at night marked by an unmistakable old world charm or last year's brilliantly muted and moving fairy tale like romantic drama photograph batra's films tend to leave behind a characteristic aftertaste an aftertaste of having watched something special a few weeks ago I got a chance to chat with Ritesh and ask him about some of the recurring themes in his films and some of my favorite scenes from his films. Ritesh also touched on few aspects of writing characters, his process on sets, and some of the cinema which he likes, like films of Abbas Kiarostami and Louis Malle. Whether you're an aspiring screenwriter, a filmmaker, or just a cinephile, I think you might find something to take away from Ritesh's insights. So let's get right to it. Here's my chat with Ritesh Patra. So Ritesh, uh, one of the things that always pops up as a recurring shade in your writing uh, is nostalgia. You know, whether it is um, Sajid Fernandez who's watching his wife's uh, VHS tapes of Yezo uh, Hezindagi or Mr. Soda Bottle Wala uh, lovingly filling a bottle of uh, Campa Cola. even the casting of bharati atsrekar i thought was uh, perhaps a nostalgic kind of a tip of the hat to the 80s tv show uh, wagle ki duniya um my question to you is do you think uh, living away from home has a lot to do with that uh, i ask that because i know you have lived out of india for a long time and uh, b a lot of people like me who have been living outside india often tend to look back at their home city through a nostalgic lens uh yeah you know yeah i think that's probably what it is i don't think about it too much honestly um because it's just you know it's just uh, most of the time you're thinking about what you're doing at the time the work uh but you know you're probably right you're probably right it has it it just that has something to do with it for sure uh being away makes you nostalgic and that's just how it is absolutely right 
And was uh, the casting of um, Atsurekar kind of a um, tip of the hat to the show? Or is that the reason why you decided to cast her? Oh, you know, I don't, honestly, I don't know if it's a tip of the hat to, to her show, which I really loved. You talked right. about Mr. and Mrs. Wagle, I think. Yes, uh, yes. Wagle no, Kitty. Yeah, yeah. Clearly, I saw when I was a kid. But, but really, she has this amazing voice. And uh, you can actually picture her, you know. Uh, it's a really singular kind of voice she has. And, and, and uh, she would be the best person to make that part work. So when she said yes, it was really a big thrill for me. But it was really her voice that always stuck with me. And and she came in and she did it. And she was just as amazing as I thought she would be. And um, Sajan, uh, the name Sajan, always wondered why you chose uh, that name for uh, Irfan's character. Any particular reason uh, for that? Uh, you know, uh, when I started writing it, I just remembered. I, I wasn't sure. The thing is that names don't matter so much until they sure. do. So when I started writing, I didn't know I was going to stick with that name. Uh, but it was just somebody that I had come across many years ago because I grew up in Bandra. And uh, that I think the generation before me, uh, a lot of the Catholics living there were giving their kids, uh, you know, these kinds of interesting names. You know, there was not everybody was not Peter D'Souza or, or, uh, <laughs> sure. or Jonathan or something. They were giving their kids uh really interesting names like that which were either you know hindu names or muslim names or something that stood between the two um so i i just i just knew that so i thought that somebody of his age would have that kind of a name so i was just trying to make it really local and specific and to my you know because it's a world that i i knew from the back of my you know in the back of my hand um but then as i started writing uh and uh that song came into play, uh, the song from that movie, Sajan. It just the whole, then then there was no way to change the name later, you know, because it just became so ingrained in the in the whole being of the thing and the script. Um, but yeah, that there was no, you know, sort of big thought process behind it, except that it was a, it was a thing that was going on a generation before me, that that's what the generation that Sajan belongs to. And I'd come across enough people who had names like that. And then it just, you know, the movie came back to me and the movie is from when she was young, you know, and uh, because she's she's exactly my generation, like my age. And that's when that movie came out when we were growing up. So so it just all made sense, you know, just made sense to do it. Right, right. And um, it does make sense. And you do kind of feel like, uh, you know, we get to see that Ila says later on that that's uh, one of her favorite movies or she likes the soundtrack. And like yeah, you said, it does go, feel you like you just have to go where the process leads you, and you and and oftentimes you. I have also discovered that if if you allow yourself to be left alone and you do your thing, before you go out to the world and and you invite other people into the process, I think it's really important to just first follow the process and let it be what it needs to be. And and then open yourself up to the world and, and the whole business of it. But these kinds of things, the question you asked, that only happens if you if you really follow if you really follow the thing. Because you know when you're creating something, over time it's if you're honest about it, it starts telling you what it wants to be. Um, and and then you have to be able to listen to it. Um, and 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 just keep communication with it. You know, your your writing, but the thing is also telling you what it wants to be. In lunchbox and photograph, uh, the details about the cities, so to speak, you know, play a considerable hand in storytelling. And my question to you was going to be, how do you go about letting that detail onto your canvas uh, without allowing it to overshadow your story or the characters? Uh, you seem to have managed to do it so well in both these films. You know that in those two movies that you mentioned. Most of the effort while shooting them has always been to keep the city and the place out. And that's that's actually what you're saying is really interesting because when you try to do that, and uh, then it somehow creeps in, mm. in in a way that it makes sense for the story. Because you look at Bombay and it's like, and look at it with the local eye, like especially for these stories that come out of my pen, I have that eye. It, the, the city is so overwhelming. There's so much going on in these backgrounds, whether they are controlled or not. You know, that's not the point. Like, 
if you shoot something in the gateway of India with a lot of people around, and you you had better shoot it in a way that's centered around your characters. Otherwise, if you're just gonna cover it, you know, it's the the background is gonna overwhelm the foreground, you know. Um, and of course, you know, you can make lens choices and stuff, but all that goes together, the choice of lens, the camera move, how you're shooting it. But but really, I, my whole focus has been on shooting it so the city doesn't overwhelm the story. But then if you if you follow that discipline, I think somehow, and you don't always succeed. By no means am I saying that I've succeeded in every scene or every shot of that of any of these movies. But what I'm saying is that if you follow that discipline, then you just get enough of the city creeping in. And in fact, you know, maybe it does creep in significantly because that's on your mind. It's on your mind that I've got to, I've got to keep this, make this serve my story. You know, I don't have to start serving it. Um, otherwise, th- that's when, you know, the thread thread can get lost. You could be sitting in the editing room wondering how to put something together because you were, uh, you allowed the background to overwhelm the foreground, especially in a place like India. So many colors, so many smells. I mean, it's, it's so overwhelming. Sometimes you're shooting on location. It's very overwhelming uh, because there's literally hundreds of people in the crew, thousands of people watching. It's And this is not for a big movie. I'm just saying a regular, like a small movie. Um, and so you have to keep your wits about you. And that discipline to just try to keep things out, uh, that when I'm shooting in India, that helps me a lot. Yeah, it's interesting because, uh, like you said, you try and not let that um, make it the center uh, piece, of course, but somehow it creeps in. But it's beautiful in both those movies because um, you know anybody who has lived in Bombay or something, just one glimpse and you could tell that that movie is based in that city. Another thing I noticed was uh, one of the recurrent themes in your films is serendipitous connections. And I was wondering what draws you to that theme. Well, you know, I don't know. It, I think, uh, well, um, what it's, well, I think I'll have answer your question in a way that uh, that maybe is helpful to people to who are trying to do this in some way, you know, uh, because in in the in these movies, uh, they're not typically, you know, what you would call a romantic comedy. Um, they are love stories in a way, but but there's a convention of a romantic comedy, the meet cute, you know. Um, and how how do people meet? And uh, uh, and that is always going to be ha- going to have some chance to it, a serendipity to it. Now, how they meet, you know, it goes back to your older question about nostalgia and um, and stuff like. So, in the fabric of the movie, like because the movies are nostalgic and the characters are nostalgic, they end up meeting in old-fashioned ways, um, and I find that interesting. Because it fits with the fit with the whole sort of fabric of the movie, um, so they don't meet on the phone or cell phone with the wrong number or you know on an app or something. They meet in an old-fashioned way. I, I don't have a sort of attraction. I don't. I don't think chance is a theme or anything. It's just a tool to get two people to meet, and then if it's integrated with with sort of the fabric or the feeling of the story, then that kind of works. I I don't. I'm, I hope that answers your question. But but I could go on if if you wanna be more specific about that but I, I i feel like it's just a it's taking a convention of a genre and uh, and using it to your own end you know uh, even if you're not writing a romantic comedy it doesn't mean that you can't take the conventions of a co- romantic comedy and use them use them to good effect in your own story um, so i think that's probably what more of what's going on there uh, rather than like an attraction to chance or you know um, but but yeah, I, th- I I think that's what it is. I, I think it's just the the most honest way that those two people could meet, because like Eli and Sajan are not the kind of people who would like say exchange phone numbers, you know. All right. So so to keep the letter writing going, first is the chance that they meet, but then after that, how do you earn that chance? Like how do you sustain it? You know, uh, and that's because. It's it's those characters could only meet that way, and then those characters will only con- continue their communication that way because both those characters are not the kind of people who would say, "Hey, what's your phone number? You know, what's your mobile number?" That's 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 not what they're gonna do, and and you and kind of have to construct it in a way in terms of the performances play a big part in that, 
but also what's on the page and and their being and and the and and the pace at which they are performing and everything it kind of has to make you believe without ever saying it it has to make the audience believe that these two people are not those kind of people you know who would say okay now let's take this communication to another level um this they are, they are just fine with that level you know that's there's a level of intimacy that they achieve just by doing it that way um and and chance is only how they meet but but it's not really the it, it's really more about who they are even how they meet is is about who they are because there's no other way these two people could have met you know like he wouldn't have struck up a conversation with her somewhere he's just not going to do that you know and neither is she um so yeah yeah that that's uh, without being too vague i think uh, i hope that answers your question and i'm just trying to be like sort of because it's a really good question i'm just trying to go a little bit deeper into it oh no no i i get you i get you yeah because i uh, i always thought that was one of the themes uh, because um, and maybe it's only for these two movies that we have been talking about so far and we'll talk about the other movies of course but um, I, i i definitely see what you're saying i i mean i uh, like you said i think the word you used was uh, just a means of uh, you know making um, those characters uh, meet and that makes sense I uh, really liked um, Our Souls at Night. Um, you know, I thought it was one of the most um, tender tales about love and companionship and life's uh, twilight years in recent years. Uh, you worked with Rampling in your second movie, then went on to work with Fonda and Redford in your third. My question is, uh, when a relatively new director is, quote unquote, directing someone like Fonda, Rampling, or Redford, how does he or she get past the awe and get down to doing their job? well of course you know the big admirer of of their work and uh, of their being and you know michelle trampling is someone that's so uh, amazing in her talent and and she's really the kind of actor that works works from the inside out you know and, and you can you know there on on and i don't stand sit in front of a monitor and i try to be as close to the camera as possible um and that that really gives you, you you know when you're their first audience watching a take you know something really special is going on with her always um but but you know i've been really sort of fortunate that almost all the people that i worked with have been super collaborative and and really there to find something deeper in the scene and and that's what i like to do i like like to find something deeper over takes like i don't like to do like okay we are going to do these three takes we're going to do it three different ways and move on you know i like to interrogate it i like to interrogate the thing so hopefully we are rehearsing first if we are not then not takes are our rehearsal you know we sometimes the actors are busy and you don't have time for rehearsal so the the actual take that we are shooting is the rehearsal and then over takes we talk to each other you know well, i suggest something not a line reading or anything i just talk to them about a scene or i talk to them something parallel or i tell them what i was thinking when i was writing it just it just i think overtakes build build trust you know i think i think often times like sometimes we've done like 18 takes 19 takes with these actors and it's always we always try to go you know go deeper into something and sometimes you know i see filmmaking is such a it's also a laborious process because there's a camera involved and there's a crew and there's a camera move and sometimes you're just doing another take just for the camera you know um but you still have to sort of jump in and keep it interesting for the actor you can't really say hey we we'll do another one for no reason and that's also been a learning for me because sometimes i know that i need another one just for just for that reason you know for a technical reason um but over time i've learned that you know i still have the responsibility to keep excavating it for the actor uh because it's very hard for actors it's very hard to just do you know a take after take after take and 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 still give and do something interesting or feel like they're doing something you know working to an end uh but you know hopefully that answers your question because i i feel like of course there's the awe and of course there's uh uh it's hard not to be in awe of these people um but but i think what always happens is that if you get a week to rehearse or after the first two three days of the shoot all that or you have to set all that aside and you do it, do it because you just have to get through the day every day these days are hard you know when you're shooting something every day is really hard 
because you you don't ever I've never been in a situation where I got uh, I often got everything I wanted, but but every time I have thought of more things uh, that I want on the set, you know, in terms of just number of shots, num- num- things that you that come to you when you're working on something, and then you don't have time to get it get them, you know, you, because these movies are are not huge movies. Uh, they are they are fairly intimate. They are fairly constrained in their budgets and shooting days. So uh, I think you really learn to depend on each other, not just me and the actors. Uh, oftentimes, even you know when it's really worked and when I've enjoyed myself, I've had a really great time with everybody on set. Uh, unfortunately for me, that's happened most of the time, you know. And uh, that's what that's what I'm always looking for and looking to create now. That it's if if you are enjoying yourself with the people you're working with. You are earning their trust. They are earning yours, and you're doing something good together. That's usually a sign that you're doing something good together. I guess, like you said, I mean, the process kind of sucks you in so fast that there is no time for all <laughs> getting awestruck and starstruck. Yeah, you know, maybe, maybe it's just. But I think it's just everything is about time. You know, how much time you spend together, and not just the quantity, also the quality of that time. Uh, but I have found that once you start shooting. And and if if you are uh, willing and able to to excavate something, then oftentimes you know then it becomes much easier to work with people, and and people enjoy working like that too. Um, and I'm I'm always ready with my pen to you know if something's not working, I will change it. You know I'll change it and I'll reorder it or I'll nip out dialogue. And so I keep it very I keep it quite collaborative. You know. Um, and I know for myself that when when a scene or a movie has worked, that's how I have worked on it. And and when it hasn't, you know, uh, then I you know then I've done something that's not that's is is just as a process is is not is not has not worked. So obviously the product that comes out of it, you know, doesn't fully work either. But but if you are working with people and doing a back and forth and you are really interrogating interrogating the material as you're shooting it and you're, you're not just going in there and shooting it um, but you are trying to get deeper into a scene and uh, it's a good sign for me always when I'm talking to actors and I'm 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 just taking away dialogue you know I'm just taking away dialogue between takes like you know how about why do you need this you, you don't really need this because you're saying it without saying it all those things are really fun it's fun for the actor it's fun for me um, but but that's really what it's about you know no, it doesn't matter Everybody's there to do that. Uh, it doesn't matter uh, how much success they've had before um, or not. But but real people who are good at their jobs are there to do that. They're there to work, and they're there to make it better take after take. You know, they're there to excavate it with you, to interrogate it. And uh, Fonda and Redford, um, just absolute icons. I mean, uh, you know, bring this rare combination of emotional depth and such. Um, rich uh, cinematic pedigree. Um, are you a big fan of their movies from 60s and 70s, um, like uh, Barefoot in the Park? Yeah, the, of course. Yeah, you know, I, uh, I've seen all their movies together. They've done, I think, three. Three, yes. Before this one, before the one that we did together. But yeah, I've seen all their movies together and also individually, you know, I mean, we've seen their whole sort of canon of work. So yeah, I was a big fan. I was always a big fan. Uh, so when the opportunity came up to work with them, that was the main reason. I did it, and also I, I'm a voracious reader, so I had read Kent Haruf before, and sure. this was a new book, and I hadn't read this. This was his last book, but then I picked it up and I read it when the when the when the thing came to me, uh, when the script came to me. Uh, but but you know, it, it was just something for me that made sense because it was these two people involved, and it was Kent Haruf, and and also the writers, you know, Scott and Michael, they were super collaborative and really nice people. Um, so that, that's those are probably the three reasons why I did it, you know. Um, right. That it was the novelist whose whose books I had loved. It was it was to work with Redford and Fonda, and and to work with these two writers. You know, because I I've usually most of the time I've enjoyed uh, directing my own material, I, because I can really feel it in my bones when I'm on set. Uh, right. I just enjoy that more, and I try to do that more often. Uh, but but to work with those guys was was really nice. 
Ritesh, would love to hear from you on uh, some of the, my favorite scenes from uh, your movies. And I'll just set up the scene so we can uh, talk about that. And uh, the first scene that I wanted to talk to you with was uh, from Photograph. And this is when Ruffy is getting ready to head out. And we see him kind of doing his air in front of two mirrors placed uh, side by side. And Ruffy sees uh, two very different images in those two mirrors you know, hinting at two very different um, realities. In the smaller vanity mirror, the only thing we see is uh, Rafi's reflection. While in the adjacent larger mirror, we see Rafi's daddy as well, sort of looming um, behind Rafi. And both those views or realities are presented side by side. One comes with the other. Gateway ke saath, uh, taj free of sorts. Uh, what, what can you share with us about that lovely scene? Oh, you know, but how that shot was framed and stuff. I mean, I, I honestly, I don't think of it that intellect, like not, not, not. I wouldn't say intellectually because that's not <laughs> nice. One, but I didn't think of it that intelligently. It was we had those two mirrors there for a reason because we had built that set and we wanted to wanted it to be fairly true, not exactly true to what an actual place like that would look like, you know. Um, and we wanted it to be compact because because then we could create opportunities to to construct inter- interesting shots like that. Because you know if you have a, a larger location and if you give yourself a larger location, uh, of course you can look at make it look smaller on camera. But then you also lose opportunities to be creative, you know, because because giving yourself some limitations forces you to be to be creative to find interesting foreground elements. You know, like we had this wrought iron staircase thing near the hatch that we often shot through and uh, to, to, to just find some uh, impose some discipline on us uh, in, in the way we'll frame our shots and also like being I think that shot was a product of just putting ourselves into those limitations so a, a, probably a boring way to shoot that scene would have been just to shoot the, the, the shoot Rafi just cover them but but that the shot you're mentioning is kind of our, our master for the scene where, where you know I'm always trying to look for a shot where I can just run the whole scene. So the shot, the one shot that tells the story of the whole scene, and then of course then we shoot other things too. You know, like in that scene we have a couple of other shots, but but the one shot that tells the story of the first half of the scene, you know, before he walks out of those mirrors. Um, so that was kind of our master for that half of the scene. Uh, but really, I didn't really, I, I, I didn't think of it so articulately, like the way you said it is th- those, those things, I think if uh, an audience watches it and they, they, and you know, maybe it was deep in my subconscious, you know, and, and that's nice when you're really deeply involved in something, um, things are there in your subconscious and maybe you identified something that was in my subconscious because I was really, when I was making that movie, I was really inside it. I was really into it. And I, if I could feel it because all my decisions were coming out from from a place of instinct. You know, I wasn't spending tons and tons of time thinking about them. You know, I was I would talk to Ben Kutchins, our DOP, and we were really in sync about doing about finding shots like that, about doing subtle camera moves. But we really had disciplined ourselves that that we had spoken about finding the one shot that tells the story of the whole scene. And, and once we got that shot, then we felt like, well, if, if we we'll shoot some other things, but we are really happy with this one shot and we can run this most of the scene on it, you know, and that was with every scene in that movie. Uh, and and even, even, even Lunchbox, I think it was most of the time I was looking, oftentimes I was looking for that one shot. Of course, I had different rules for the two movies. Like in Lunchbox, I did not move the camera unless the characters moved. Uh, and, but in this movie, you know, I had these subtle push-ins. Sometimes you would see the actor doing something interesting with their feet because they, they'd be performing with their whole being, you know. So we would grab a shot of the feet. Um, and But but the specific question you're asking, that specific shot, was, was to get us a master for the scene, you know, that, that we felt like this shot tells the story of the whole scene. And, and we don't have to, like, cover the scene in a small little room, you know. And uh, because that's not interesting, you know, she's actually in his face this way. So it just it just worked. It felt like the right thing to do. Uh, but you know, you said it. You you said it in a much more articulate way than I than I am describing it. For me, it was just an instinct. You know? 
And uh, it kind of, um, it's reminiscent of a scene from Lunchbox, I thought, you know, where um, another beautiful scene and favorite scene of mine where um, Sergeant writes to Ila that the reason he did not show up for their date at Cooler Cafe, um, the, because earlier that day, you know, he kind of felt his age in a way uh, when he walked in the room and he calls it the smell of an old man. Uh, both those scenes I thought marked uh, for Sajin and Rafi, their um, reality is dawning on them, if you will. Um, so, you know, I thought that was like a, there was an interesting parallel there as well. Oh, uh, yeah. No, I don't know. Maybe, you know, there's just a use of mirrors. There's another scene also in Lunchbox when she is asking her husband about the second child. And and he's looking into a mirror. Right. Yes. There. But, you know, this this use of mirrors in rooms and stuff is just... Uh, it's oftentimes it's I don't like to talk in metaphors and stuff because I don't think they really work for movies but once you're done with the work once you're done with the work you find that um, something has slipped in that that kind of is like somebody facing themselves and you, you know in the scene between Ila and her husband there was no way to make that scene work with those two people looking at each other and talking because he was trying to avoid her question so the mirror became a good device for to force him um, to look at her and to address her. And she's kind of chasing him around the room, you know. After he moves away from the mirror, she goes and faces him, you know. And, and then he brushes her off. So, so the mirror became a way for her to connect with him when she wasn't doing it. In the other scene you mentioned, uh, when he goes in there and he's taking in this smell, you know, it, it kind of just dawned on me after the movie was over that that we put him there because, you know, uh, that, that mirror again, he was like seeing himself in a new way, new light for the first time. But it wasn't like, it wasn't something I thought of before I shot it in that case. And also in Rafi's case, as I told you, it was just a way of us, a beautiful way for us to frame the shot and just just use the restrictions we had to, to create a great master for the scene, the master that we thought is great. Um, but but each time is a different reason. But yeah, I think these the use of mirrors. I think I, I I try to use them to good effect often. Like even in our souls at night, there's a pretty emotional scene when when Fonda's character is telling Redford's character about how her how her daughter died. Oh yes, uh, yes. And and that scene also didn't make sense to me to have them talking in bed or sitting or facing each other. That's the kind of story that you know you would tell someone you know while while not looking at them. Uh, and then when you're doing that and, and you tell an actor not to look at another one, then when you're sitting in the editing room, it becomes really difficult to cut between the two people uh, because the look is what motivates the cut, right? So so I find that use of mirrors like gets me out of those kinds of jams, you know, where I can place people not facing each other and you can see both the characters and, and you know, she's talking to him, but she's not looking at him. Uh, he's in the mirror and you can see him there, you know? So uh, it's not really a, it, it's, it's, it's this whole, you know, when you have an instinct, then you follow it. Uh, if you have an instinct that the characters won't look at each other, then you have to find another, another solution. It's, it's mostly like a little bit of problem solving and it's, it's a little bit of creativity. And, and that's what, you know, I think oftentimes I find when I'm on a set, that's what's really going on. You know, it's a little bit of problem solving and a little bit of creativity. Everything's kind of coming together hopefully in a way that works. I also like the very last scene from the film, uh, the filming photograph, you know, where you hold the frame in the cinema lobby after Miloni and uh, Ruffy leave. I just thought there was just such a quaint beauty in that dilapidated um, theater lobby. Uh, you know, there are lovely uh, pastel hues there. What was your brief um, to the DOP for the film's look and later on for the coloring of the film? But, you know, uh, for that movie, we were we were both had, had a similar instinct that we wanted to tell something, something realistic, but it should look, it should have a whiff of, of being fairy tale like. Uh, so it should look really beautiful, but it should look very real. Um, and we work pretty hard on, on his environment, especially. So whenever we are in the slum or on his side of the story, Unless it's a day exterior outdoor at the gateway, you know, then there's only so much you can do. But uh, uh, we always try to make it make it look really fairy tale like, because this is kind this kind of thing would never happen in real life, right? Uh, 
it's a fairy tale and and it's happening because of the way these two people are uh, they both have something to get out of this so they're going along on this journey and it's going to end at some point because it's it's a story it's a fairy tale and uh, so that that was always our thought in in while we were selecting our locations when we were selecting the colors on the wall when we were discussing how to light it we were always trying to make it like we were trying to balance it between a reality and and with a whiff of a uh, whiff of fiction with a uh, sort of make make it look a little fairy tale like um so that that's essentially what we were trying to do so we would we would exaggerate you know sort of the warmer notes in in his slum in his room especially it was quite warm um and and in her end of the story we would just make it much colder her world just kind of drab you know it's this drab bombay humdrum middle class life that she's trapped in um and then when she was with the maid you know we would bring in hints of his world in the kitchen the kitchen is kind of lit like you know a little bit like how his his slum is lit but yeah we were always thinking of how to how to unify unify this idea of uh, of or something very realistic with with a fairy tale um but that's that's roughly what we were going for without being too obvious about it and which uh, cinema hall was it uh, was this uh, shot at ritesh you know i don't remember the name of the location it was a really beautiful single screen and somewhere in this bombay central um, in bombay central okay yeah well, i don't remember what it was called it was pretty dilapidated and, and then we embellished it a little bit you know with the posters and we did yeah. the walls and stuff but yeah, yeah. but it's this really uh, run down place um uh, but i don't remember the name of it okay okay but it does look beautiful it, it's like a time capsule from 80s or something you know i really love it yeah yeah and we 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 had something to do with that too you know it is just a updated <laughs> place and then we we kind of embellished it a little bit yeah gotcha gotcha wanted to touch on influences on your cinema and your style of storytelling you know david denby once said of abbas uh, kirastani that he has this wonderful habit of plunging you into the story and then pulling the rug underneath would it be accurate to say that you do something similar by way of uh, open ended endings and also do you see kirastami as an uh, influence yeah you know i i love the movies of kirastami um i love i love how meditative they are but but i don't know you know look I, honestly i don't spend so much time thinking about myself and uh, i did a lot of interviews when these movies were coming out and stuff it was always a big chore for me uh not appreciate it appreciate i appreciate people who want to learn and know about the movie um and and i like talking about it when it's coming out but uh i just don't ever uh, ever spend too much time thinking about myself you know uh when i'm i'm working or thinking about what i want to do that's that's when i'm thinking about what i want to do and of, of course you you can't separate yourself from your work and that's not you know it's not like that's my work and this is me and it's two different things it's not that but um but yeah you know i'm usually influenced by a lot of different directors i love louis mal's work i really admire how how you, you he gets you know he puts his characters and his stories forward and and of course if you if you really are looking at his work and you've seen his work multiple times you can see him in it but but he's not approaching his work with a, with you know with like well, like a signature you know uh like he doesn't want to sign it like an artist you know like a painter would sign a painting every painting like some filmmakers have are doing something in every movie you know uh they have a specific signature and uh uh i really aspire to that i really aspire to louis mal's work because of that you know that his stories and characters are are front and center uh not him uh and kirostami is the same way for me like i've seen his movies and each is each is different very different but but similar in, in the sense that that most of his movies i find them to be really honest uh even askar farhadi same thing uh korea the same thing you know they're always trying to do something new but it's it's same in the sense that that it's uh it's it's honest in a way that only they can be um but but that, that's about you know it's, i think i can talk about more influences but but i would tell you the same thing about every 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 director i admire 
Okay. And do you, um, would you agree about the open-ended um, endings? Is that something that you see there is a similarity or um, is there um, accurate parallel there? Uh, yeah, you know, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if they're open-ended, but what you've got to get out of a movie once the characters have transformed, there's no reason to, to keep telling the story, you know? Um, so that's, I think that's what the ending is when the characters changed, you know, one character or both characters, whatever you were going for. Uh, and then it's time to get out of the movie so that people can take it home mm. with them. Well, thanks, Ritesh. Thanks for chatting with us today. I really enjoyed this. I really enjoyed this. Thanks for reaching out to me. It was it was fun for you, too. I really enjoyed talking to you. Thanks a yeah. lot, Ritesh. Hey, take care of yourself. God, be safe. You, too. Bye-bye. That was my chat with Ritesh Patra. Hope you liked it. And like I said before, hope you found something to take away. By the way, I don't think enough people have seen Our Souls at Night for some reason. I would highly recommend that film. It's one of the most affectionate tales about companionship in the twilight years of life. And Fonda and Redford are simply stellar. It streams on Netflix US. If you have a comment, suggestion, or anything which you would like to add to the conversation held on the episode, do drop me a comment on Twitter. Also, do subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to your podcast. And drop us a review when you get a chance. You can follow me on Twitter at Love of Cinema SF8 for podcast related updates and my tweets on all things movies. That's the episode. This is Manshu signing off. And like always, thank you for listening to the Love of Cinema podcast. Mm-hmm.